Well, it's my pleasure today to introduce to you a man some of you know, many of you know as a personal friend. Some of you are getting to know Pastor Ronald Gray. Um, Ron is my very good friend. Ron and I have been friends for over 20 years, and we have traveled the world together. We have literally um, prayed together and met together and dug holes together and carried rocks together and built things together and preached together in more countries than I can count. And uh, it is a pleasure. We serve on leadership boards together. Uh, we um, help missionaries Ron's ministry, his purpose in his ministry is to set other people up for success. It is most unique in his ministry. He's the only person I know that what he does on a regular basis is serve up balls so other people can spike them. So missionaries can spike the ball, so pastors can spike the ball. And I love being his friend. And this morning, uh, somebody was in the service, and uh, they came up to me after service and said, said, Dwayne Higgison, you are a blessed man. And I said, I received that. And they said, if you have that man as your good friend, you are a blessed man. And I said, yes, I am. How many of you believe Ron Gray's a good friend to have? And so this is what, Ron, we're going to start with a video. I'm going to, just because I want you to know what Ron is up to around the world. He is a, a, a part of Grace Temple's extended family. He's a, we voted him into the church. He's an honorary member here at Grace Temple, no matter where he lives and where he serves, and uh, I, I've asked him to make sure that he shares with you some of what's going on because so many of us are so connected with him. And then after we see that video for a few minutes, then uh, he's going to come and share it. I know that you'll make him welcome as he comes. But right before we do that, I just want to say a big shout out to Kenny Johnson and Vera and Miss uh, Pat and the team that was over at the field house this morning making a difference, doing a service for the homeless, feeding the homeless, making a difference, and then they've come back here to worship now and receive as they've been giving. Would you let them know we appreciate them serving, making a difference? Now, if you would give your attention to the screen uh, for a minute.
Good morning, Grace Temple. Good morning. Did you notice that about every third or fourth slide had Grace Temple on it? That's because Grace Temple is probably, is not just probably, is the church that has the greatest mission emphasis of any church that I go to, period. You are involved in the world. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 And... Uh, we're involved together in sharing the kingdom of God in so many different places. Thank you, Grace Temple, for what you do, for what you are, for sharing in so many different ways. We've just had some wonderful trips together. The Philippines was amazing. Uh, getting off a plane, being taken immediately to a place. Dwayne and I taught all day. Go uh, spend the night, get on a boat the next morning, get off the boat, go to another meeting. We ministered to over three hundred pastors in three days and shared the word of the Lord with them. Encouraged. I'm still getting notes on Facebook every week from pastors saying, thank you for coming. When are you coming back? We want you to come back. We want you to share. So thank you, Grace Temple. We had a great time in Cambodia as the guys taught self-defense and it was just a, it was just such a great opportunity. You know, I was, um, I was thinking about some of the things that, um, God did this last year. You saw Samuel Kigo and his wife, Sarah, who are missionaries from Kenya, Africa to Italy. That's powerful. That's powerful. You have to kind of process that. We, I was at a service with Mike McCarty where a Kenyan lady, Sarah, was the translator translating for Mike to speak from English to Italian, and she was Kenyan. And I was trying to process that how all that works together. But it was amazing as we saw God. It's, it's one of our first fruits of somebody that has come through our school in Kenya that is now a missionary to Italy. How great is that? So we're trying to put together a team to go help him and uh, be able to do that. We, we're looking forward to, uh, in the next month, I will be going to uh, uh, Poland again to do a men's conference. Then I'll be uh, coming back. I'll be going to Cuba Again, I just got back from Cuba two weeks ago. Uh, it's my sixth trip to Cuba, and God is working there in powerful ways, and we're looking forward to going there. By the way, I'm looking for some used laptops. If you have a used laptop, maybe you upgraded in the last year or two, and, and you know what's a year or two old for us is basically amazing to them. And I'm going to be taking some laptops back. And I told Pastor, I'm, I'm quite amazed that every time I go now, they have a little more Wi-Fi. A little. Okay? And so uh, if you have a used laptop, I, I would really appreciate that. And you can bring it here to the church, and we'll get, I'll find a way to pick it up and take care of that. But um, God's working uh, in Cuba. I'm taking a team back in July to do some more children's ministry there. And so the Lord's working. You know, Dwayne was talking about uh, me being a good friend, but let me just tell you also about it, having a mutual friendship. Uh, last year, we were in Cuba together, and we were teaching my book. He was helping me to teach my book to a group of pastors, and something happened to me that does not happen very often. I got sick. I don't know if I ate something at a moment, but I, was, I, I got sick, and as I was finishing up my teaching session, I knew that I was finished. And so I just looked over at Dwayne, and I said, Dwayne, you were not supposed to be up, but you are up now. I'm leaving. And so, so he taught 
the next hour, and then he comes back into the little room where I was. He said, are you better? I said, nope, you got to teach again. Keep going, buddy. And so, <laughs> so he kept teaching, and I was so thankful for him, just filled in there and took care. And, you know, I had another experience in that moment that was probably one of the most humbling experiences for me. Some of the team that was in Cuba with us last year knows uh, Lazaro, who's the chef. Uh, he cooks for us out at the farm. It's an interesting place. It's out in the middle of nowhere, but he wears a big chef's hat like he's, uh -huh. like he's cooking at a major restaurant, okay? I was so, I was just not feeling well at all, and Lazaro came in there, and he speaks very little English, and he sat down behind me and put his hands on me, and he sang over me for 20 minutes. Just sang. Just sang. Now, he wasn't a good singer. He was, he, he, it was not good. <laughs> but he sang over me with faith. And the Lord touched me and healed me, and I was able to get back up and get going, and it only lasted for that little while. And so the Lord touched me. But it was a great humbling experience. And then in June, we're going to Kenya again. And uh, we're going to go, I, I, I just thought how cool it is as God puts things together. Years ago, Dwayne was there teaching, and uh, he actually used Alex as an illustration. And Alex was a Turkana warrior, uh, I mean a real literal warrior, and wound up coming to the school, going through the school, and he's become on staff of the school, and now he's pastoring. And so we're going to take a team over in June, and we're going to build him a little church building on a piece of property, and we're going to lay 7,000 bricks. Wow. 7,000 bricks. Pastor's going to get to mix more concrete and mortar. Oh, y'all pray for him. Uh, but uh, what, a, what a great opportunity. I was thinking today, uh, today, Kel and Danielle McGraw are here, and, and uh, uh, I was thinking that they, uh, Kel went to a little church in Citronelle, Alabama. What, it wasn't even quite in Citronelle. It was just kind of out, <laughs> out in the boonies out there. And, and um, I happened to go there and preach for a number of years. I, I preach at places where sometimes people don't even know exist, uh, not only out of the country, but in the country. And uh, met Kel and his family, and, and then... They, uh, many years ago, a team went to Kenya to help build the, the, uh, 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 the training center, the Leroy Curtis Training Center, and uh, Danielle happened to go on that trip, and so they fell in love. And so now they got married, and they live in Birmingham, and I've got four kids, and just doing great. So the moral to this is if you come on a mission trip with me, and you're single, who knows what could happen? God... God could work miracles, but we're so glad. And now Kel took a mission trip. He led a mission trip last year to Nepal, and you're planning to take one to Japan this year, Kel? Is that still in the works? You're planning to maybe do that? And so, I, you know, I believe that, that, you know, things just keep moving forward, and I'm so thankful for that. Thank you, Grace Temple, for standing with us. Thank you for helping us be about the Father's business. Last year... My, my, my PowerPoint was a little longer than it usually is, but last year I went to 12 countries. Wow. Count them. I hit a whole new mark with Delta Airlines. They gave me a metal tag. I mean, I went from plastic to metal. That, you got, that's saying something, okay? So I, I traveled 175,000 air miles last year with Delta Airlines. And so uh, you just pray for us. Uh, we're going to India this year. Uh, to be able to hope to plant a, a uh, ministry school there. By the way, in Cuba, uh, that's one of our goals there is to, is to plant a ministry training institute just like we have in Kenya and Uganda and Mexico. Uh, we're hoping to take Sergio to Mexico in November so that he can see a school in business and see how it works, how it flows together. So the Lord is just doing a lot of things all over. But it's because of people like you who sow and give and share and have a heart for the world. So thank you, Grace Temple, for what you do. I appreciate you so much. Thank you for your faithful support of me and uh, our missionaries and all the things that God is doing around the world. So it's just a wonderful time to see what God is doing. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Turn in your Bible today to Ephesians chapter 1, and I want to read verses 3 through 14. Ephesians 1, 
3 through 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for the worship. Thank you, God, for your presence here, God. Lord, in your presence is fullness of life. And God, I ask you right now, Lord, to give ears to hear what your spirit would say to us. We honor you and we give you all the glory and all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to talk to you today about inheritance. We have an inheritance from God. We have something that God has promised to us. Aren't you glad that his promises are yes and amen? God has promised to us something that is guaranteed by the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. It's not guaranteed by man. It's guaranteed by the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God. Inheritance is the practice of passing on property, titles, deeds, rights, and obligations. <clears throat> Inheritance is passing on those things that belong to somebody and then it's passed on to another generation. Now, as I was praying about this, I came across a couple of stories. One is an article that I read. It's a story about a college kid in Germany named Sergi. He was a normal college kid working to put himself through college, living on around $240 a month. He got a knock on the door by a man in a suit with a briefcase. Sergi let him in to talk. The guy brought him some bad news about his uncle dying. And Sergi thought this was weird because he had only met his uncle one time. The man was a lawyer, and he informed Sergi that his uncle had no heirs. Back when Sergi was a child, he had met his uncle at a family reunion and left such an impression his uncle decided to leave his entire fortune of $975 million to Sergi. <laughs> Sergi went from having nothing to having almost a billion dollars in the bank. Now, there's a couple of things that we can learn from this story. The first thing is, be nice to your uncle at family reunions. <laughs> because you never, <laughs> you never know. So just be nice to everybody. Even that, even that sweet aunt that does that to you. Just, just love her. Just say, hey, I love you. Yeah. And second, you have to believe that an inheritance like that would change everything. Your life would be radically different. God has left us an inheritance. He's left us more than $975 million. He's left us all the riches of heaven. He's left us all the glory and the anointing that is in eternity. He's given it to you and to I. I, really came, I, 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 I was thinking of another story that I personally know. A friend of mine was a mailman in Tallahassee, Florida, where I grew up. He had a route that he walked. He did not drive. It was a downtown route. And he would go around all the streets and put mail in the slots. And one day, a dear, sweet little lady 
came to the door and asked him, said, nobody comes to visit me and said, uh, I, I have a couple of things and I think it was like a couple of lights that needed to be, to, to have new bulbs put in and said, would you please put them in for me? And my friend said to her, said, I, I can't do that as a mailman, said it's against our rules to come inside the house, but he said, after I finish my work today, I will come back and I'll be glad to do that for you. And so he did. And so she asked him to do a couple of more things and a couple of weeks passed and she asked him to do a couple of more things. And she lived in a very small apartment with no real pretense, didn't look like she had anything, was living on, pen, on her pension. Well, she died and she left my friend a million and a half dollars. Wow. You never know. You never know who has something that they can sow into your life. You never know what really God has prepared for those that love him. The Bible says, I has not seen nor ear heard what the Lord has prepared for his children. Amen? Amen. And so I got one more story I want to share with you. It's, uh, when I was thinking about this, I'd heard this some years ago, that a man, um, before the transatlantic flights took place, you had to travel by ship. And so he worked hard and saved every extra penny he had, and he had just enough money to purchase a ticket upon a cruise ship coming from Europe to America. The trip at that time required about two or three weeks to cross the ocean. He went out and bought a suitcase and filled it full of cheese and crackers. That's all he could afford. Once on board, all the other passengers went to the large ornate dining room to eat their gourmet meals. Meanwhile, the poor man would go over in the corner and eat his cheese and crackers. This, day, this went on day after day. He could smell the delicious food being served in the dining room. He heard the other passengers speak of it in glowing terms as they rubbed their bellies and complained about how full they were and how they would have to go on a diet after this trip. The poor traveler wanted to join the other guests in the dining room, but he had no extra money. Sometimes he'd lie awake at night, dreaming of the sumptuous meals the other guests described. And toward the end of the trip, another man came up to him and said, Sir, I can't help but notice that you are always over there eating these cheese and crackers at mealtimes. Why don't you come into the banquet hall and eat with us? The traveler's face flushed with embarrassment. Well, to tell you the truth, I had only enough money to buy the ticket. I don't have any extra money to purchase fancy meals. The other passengers, passenger raised his eyebrows in surprise. He shook his head and said, Sir, don't you realize that the meals are included in the price of the ticket? Your meals have already been paid for. Can I tell you something? There's a lot of people in the house of God who are living far beneath their means and your ticket has already been paid for. And it wasn't paid by you, it was paid by the blood of Jesus Christ that gave you a way where there wasn't a way and he gave you hope when there wasn't hope. And we don't have to live beneath our potential. We can enjoy the journey because your ticket has already covered all the costs. Hallelujah. Amen. I believe that God wants us to know that we have an inheritance God has given something to you. He's poured something into your life. And the question is, is are you receiving everything that God has for you? Now, there's a lot of stories that would probably say this, but one of my favorite stories is about Caleb. Now, you know the story. They were, tell, uh, they were, they were coming into the promised land. The children of Israel were right there. And, and Moses sent 12 spies into the land to find out what was there. Ten of them came back and said, there's giants there. We look like grasshoppers. We can't make it. We don't need to go. It's a bad situation. But two of them, Joshua and Caleb, came back and said, we're well able to overcome it. If God be for us, who can be against us? <laughs> but they didn't go in. And so years passed. Joshua chapter 14, beginning at verse 6. So the children of Judah came to Joshua and Gilgal. And Caleb the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, You know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God concerning you and me, in Kadesh Barnea. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. 
Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. So Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he said these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke this word to me, to Moses, while Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now, here I am this day, 85 years old. And yet, I'm as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me. Just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war, both for going out and coming in. Now, therefore, give me this mountain, of which the Lord spoke in that day, for you heard in that day how the Anakim were there, and that the cities were great and fortified, and it may be that the Lord will be with me, and I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. And Joshua blessed him, and gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, as an inheritance. Hebron, therefore, became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, to this day, because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. And the name of Hebron formerly was Kirjath Arba, and then the land had rest from war. So here we find that at 85 years old, Caleb goes to Joshua and says, Hey, remember the promise? Do you remember what Moses promised? He said that mountain was mine, and I've been waiting 45 years. I'm ready to take it. And Joshua said, It's time. Go ahead and take it. And so the Bible says that he went in and he took Hebron and he took the land. Now there's things that we can learn from this lesson. First of all, Caleb was, his very name means wholehearted, full-hearted. Let me just tell you something. If you're going to receive the promise of God, you've got to believe in the promise of God. The Bible says that there's more than 30 promises in the scripture that are related to us as believers. Now, I don't know if you know all of them, but the ones that you know, you ought to take advantage of. You ought to begin to receive the promises of God and say the promises of God are yes and amen. And what he has promised me, I'm going to take it. I'm going to receive what the Lord has said to me. I declare to you today that some of you here have had a promise from God in your life. It may have been 40 years ago. It may have been 50 years ago. It may have been 10 days ago. But whatever the promise is of God to you, it's time to take the mountain. It's time to take the promise. It's time to receive what God has for you. Now, another lesson we can learn from Caleb and Joshua in that situation is the majority is not always right. <laughs> How many of you ever told your kids when they say, well, everybody is doing it? Not everybody. We're not. We're not participating. I don't care what the majority's doing. I don't care what everybody else is doing. The majority has been wrong before, <laughs> and they might be wrong again. I'm going to believe the Lord my God. I'm going to trust in what his word says. I'm going to believe if he said it's mine, then in the name of the Lord God Almighty, it's mine. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter what you see. We walk by faith and not by sight. Amen? Amen? I believe there's something else. I don't care how old you are. <laughs> there's a few of us here that are gaining a little bit in age. I just turned 63 last Sunday. But I want to tell you something. I'm better than I've ever been. Hallelujah. I'm doing more for the kingdom of God. I traveled more last year than I've ever traveled. I believe that it's never time to quit believing. Don't give up hope. I don't care how long it's taken. You hold fast to the promise that God has given to you and believe that in its season, it will come. Amen? Amen. Now, <laughs> just because God has promised us something doesn't mean you're not going to have to fight for it. Right. There's still some giants. Right. There's still some stuff you got to overcome. It doesn't just always happen. You know, I don't know where it got in. There's this... <laughs> We talk about in our country an entitlement mentality. There's sometimes an entitlement mentality in the church. God, I have never done anything for you, but bless me anyhow, God. God, I've never, I only go, I only go to church like 25% of the time, but God, you know my heart. 
I would go if I felt a little better. I mean, well, listen, somewhere along the way, you got to get past all. The, we're not in entitlement. Sometimes you got to fight the battle. Sometimes you got to take the mountain. You got to go through the situation. Amen. So the giants were there. Giants, Joshua 15, 13, and 14. Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, gave a share among the children of Judah according to the commandment of the Lord to Joshua, namely, Kirjath Arba, which is Hebron. Now Arba was the father of Anak, and Caleb drove out the three sons of Anak from there, Sheshai, Ahiman, and Tamai, the children of Anak. Now it's very interesting that in the scripture, almost always names have meaning. Always, always names have meaning. So Anak, the father, his name means long neck, which literally means self-will. Okay, all throughout the scripture, a long neck means self-will. His sons, a hymen, means my brother's gift. It speaks of selfishness and coveting. Talmai, another son, digging a rut. It literally means self-sufficiency, feeling com comfortable, traditions. And the third son is Sheshai, white linen, which means self-righteousness. Did you notice a word in all of their names? Self. Self keeps us from getting. The greatest problem that most of us have is not out there somewhere. The greatest problem that most of us have is right here. The greatest problem is our overcoming our own self. We have to overcome our self-will because the reality is that sometimes we know what God wants us to do. We just don't want to do it. Let me say that over here to this side. We, we know what God wants us to do. We just don't want to do it. Our problem is not knowing the will of God. Our problem is our self-will. And then the sons. Huh. Selfishness. I know that doesn't apply to anybody in here. But the reality is that sometimes we're just selfish. You know, I thank God for Grace Temple that you're not selfish with go, doing what God has called you to do. You give and you sow and you pour out into others. I believe that's the gift of God. But a lot of times the giant that we face is selfishness. We want to hoard stuff to ourselves. Tell me, I, self-sufficiency. I can do this by myself. I don't need anybody. I want to tell you something. You need other people. You need people to help you. You need the church. You need the people of God. You need people to serve with. And then... Shashai, self-righteousness. <laughs> oh, well, I've been serving God for 40 years. I deserve a medal. <laughs> it might be the others, people around you that deserve the medal <laughs> for, for, keep, for not killing you in that 40 years. Bob Mumford once said there's three demons in every church. Traditions, culture, and money. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? Because a lot of it really fits into those giants. Traditions, Tamei. The Bible says that the traditions of men make the power of God a none effect. You know, one of the things that we fight sometimes is just traditions. You come in and you sit at the same chair every week. You go through the same stuff. You go through the same little rituals all the time. You know, I pastored for 10 years. And one of the things I used to love to do just to mess people up is sometimes I'd just come in and I'd, you know, they'd be all ready for the worship team. And the worship team wouldn't be up there. And I'd say, turn in your Bibles. And they'd say, you can't do that. You, we haven't had any singing yet. I said, I don't need singing to preach. I could preach yesterday. I mean, I don't need three songs and an offer to preach. I'm ready. The singing's for you. <laughs> the singing's to help you get ready, okay? The reality is that sometimes we get into traditions. We do things that we've always done and we just get into that routine and we expect it to be that way. I'm going to tell you something. I'm praying God will mess some of us up. I'm praying God will break some of our traditions. Do something you've never done. Change. Everybody say change. Change, change is all right. Change is not bad. You need to be able to change periodically. Culture. Shashai. We live by culture. We do things sometimes because it's our culture to do it. When you travel around the world, you find out there's a lot of different culture, okay? You know, one of the things, that, you know, I, I've been coming here for a lot of years, and there's a few people that kind of move a little bit when praise and worship, but, but if you're going to go to some other cultures, you better get out your dancing shoes. 
Because, buddy, they dance. I mean, they dance. And if you don't dance, you're going to be on the outside looking in. You say, well, I don't know how to dance. Learn. you got to get with it. It's part of their culture. It's part of the way that they express themselves. You never know. But a lot of times, you know, we, we, we need to be careful. One of the things that we try to do in our schools is that we try not to impart American culture. We try to impart kingdom culture. We try to impart kingdom life. You know, culture can be different in every part. I was in Cameroon, Africa many years ago, and I was, in a, I was out in the middle of nowhere in a dirt hut. There were three of us in the hut, the missionary, the king, and me, okay? And I'm sitting on a little stool, and I sat there, and they're talking in a language I didn't know about, and I was getting bored. And all of a sudden, I mean, I'm like, I'm, I'm like I don't exist almost, but all of a sudden, I get bored, and I start to cross my leg. And the missionary stopped what he was doing. He said, don't cross your leg. I said, why? He said, only the most important person in this, in this room can cross their legs, and it ain't you. <laughs> and I'm looking at him <laughs> and the king, and I'm thinking, I got more money in my pocket than the king probably has had in his lifetime but he's still the most important person in the room. That's their culture. They kept talking for another 30 or 45 minutes, and I, oh, I, I kind of forgot what was going on, and I started to cross my leg again. I got the look from the missionary. <laughs> Don't do that. I'm telling you something. There's all kind of different cultures, and we have a culture. And sometimes we do things because we've always done it. But I'm telling you something. It's time to break some of those traditions and let God do something different in our life and accomplish his purpose. He wants to break in, but you've got to get out of that routine and out of that rut and let God do something different in your life. And then the other demon that Bob Mumford said was in the church is money. Boy, you talk about money and people's eyes glaze over. You talk about money, everybody that was happy 10 seconds ago and you say something about money or an offering and people go, ooh, ooh. Money should make us happy. <laughs> Listen, it's not money is the root of all evil. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil. There's 2,500 scriptures in the Bible that talk about money. There's 500 that talks about prayer. <laughs> Does that tell you something? We need to know about money, but a lot of times we let money, the Bible says that if you don't know how to deal with earthly money, how are you going to deal with the spiritual things of God? God wants us to learn about money. So the reality is, is that all this stuff that God has for us, we've got to break the traditions. We've got to go against the giants. We've got to come against ourselves and overcome all these ideas of the way that we think things should be and say, God... Have your will in my life. My life is not my own. I belong to you. Everything I am, everything I hope to be, I give it to you, O oh God. Now, he received an inheritance, Caleb did. Hebron, communion with God is what it means. Let me tell you something. One of the things that must happen in the house of God is we are not here to seek the hand of God. We are here to seek the face of God. We're not here just to get something from God. We are here to interact with him in his presence, his fullness of joy. In his presence, his life. In his presence, his goodness. Let me tell you something. I've had the opportunity to be around a lot of people with a lot of stuff and a lot of titles, but I'd rather be with Jesus than have everything else that the world has to offer. That should be the desire of our heart is to serve him and to live for him. You know, it would have been enough for God and his love just to save us. Amen? But Scripture says that we've sinned and fallen short of his glory. Before he saved us, we were enemies of God. We ran from him, but he came in his grace and gave us Jesus. But he didn't just stop there. He gave us an inheritance. Why? Because God doesn't just save you from your sin. He also wants you to make you his son or daughter. He wants you to be his family. It's not just enough to be saved. God wants you to know that you are an heir of the Father and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 4 says, When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, 
so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And so you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Let me tell you something. We were not children when we were children of God when we were born into this world. But through salvation, we become children of God. We're adopted into the family. And you know, the truth is, churches, I didn't know a lot about adoption until I had met a friend of mine who really walked me through adoption. And there's so many wonderful things about adoption. First of all, if you've been adopted, you can't be unadopted. Second of all, if you've been adopted, then you're just as much of a rightful heir as any, as any natural born son or daughter. In fact, it's stronger for you to be adopted to be an heir than if you were actually a natural son. Being adopted brings you into a greater place of legality than you ever were before. I'll tell you something else that I learned. Maybe a lot of you, everybody might know this, but I didn't know it until he told me this. But he went to get a passport. And when he went to get a passport, he thought that because it was his birth passport that his birth father was on there. But when he went to get his passport, to, uh, uh, to get his birth certificate, excuse me, to get his passport, I, I said that wrong, he was going to get his birth certificate to get his passport, and he thought his birth father's name would be on his birth certificate. When he went there, the birth father was not, name was not on there. His adopted father's name was on his birth certificate. What I want to tell you is something. When you become a child, a son or a daughter of God, you don't just start from here. You start from the beginning and you receive everything that is yours from your birth. Hallelujah. It just don't get any better than that. I mean, when you, when you didn't even know it, he was your father. He became your father. You may have waited until you were 50 years old, but God went back to the beginning and brings reconciliation to all things in your life and brings you to a place of inheritance in him, just like you lived there all your life. Amen? That's what God does. Now, I believe that as we come to that place, not only does he forgive you, but he makes you his son or daughter. Not only his son or daughter, but an heir. You receive the inheritance because you are a son or daughter of the king. Now, what kind of heirs are we? Scripture doesn't stop there. It begins to talk about this idea of us being heirs of God. But what kind of heirs are we? Romans 8, 15. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. The dictionary's definition of heritage is something somebody is born to. Hallelujah. You, as a, as a believer, as a child of God, you were born into this inheritance. You were born into the family of God. It's the status or character acquired by being born into a particular family or social class. <laughs> Can I just tell you something? I don't care what side of the tracks you were born on. Maybe you were born where there wasn't any tracks. Maybe you were born in a situation. Maybe you didn't have an earthly father. Maybe you didn't have an earthly mother. Maybe you've gone through all kind of stuff. But I'm making a declaration to you today in the name of the Lord God Almighty that today you've been born into the family of God and you are an heir of all eternity, of everything that God has, of everything that he's ever been, of everything that he's going to ever be. You are an heir. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> You're born into it. Heritage is something passing from one generation to another. Property or land that's passed on to an heir. A Roman historian once said, men are slower to recognize their blessings, excuse me, men are slower to recognize blessings than misfortunes. In other words, you know, there's some people I really don't want to talk to. All they ever talk about is negative stuff. Well, this, this, this I got a problem, this has, and nothing ever good ever happens to me. Listen, stop recognizing your misfortunes and recognize the blessings of God. 
I grew up singing an old hymn that says, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will amaze you what the Lord has done. Start thinking about what God has done for you in your life, where he saved you from, where he saved you to, what he's done for you, what he's accomplished in your life. Begin to praise him. Amen. There's many Christians today that walk around with an inferiority complex because they don't realize the blessings that they have in Christ. They see themselves as unworthy of the blessings. They see themselves as ill-prepared to do whatever God asked them to do. Let me just say to you, stop telling God what you can't do. You know, if you'd have told me 45 years ago that I was going to travel all around the world, I'd have told you there ain't no way that could happen. I didn't finish college. I don't have any letters after my name. I don't have any letters before my name. I don't have, I don't have any letters. But with God, all things are possible. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul tells us a different story. He says that we're blessed in Christ with every spiritual blessing. Somebody asked me one time, said, what does that mean, Ron? I don't know. I don't know what every spiritual blessing is, but I line up for it. I don't know what it is. I don't know what, I don't know what, there's just some things I don't understand, but I know they're good. Bring it on, God. Bring it on. If you're passing it out, I'm in line. I'll take it, God. Every spiritual blessing. Freedom. The Bible says that whom the Son sets free is free indeed. I want to declare to you today you're free indeed. You have the Holy Spirit. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. Thank God for the anointing that breaks the yoke of bondage and sets the captive free. Now let me say something to you today. I declare to you that God has given to you promises, over 30,000 of them. Now you may have to fight a few giants, but you're well able to overcome. You have a mountain today with your name on it. Take your mountain. I don't care how many years or how many people have told you that your time is over. The mountain belongs to you. You have an inheritance. The Holy Spirit is your guarantee. Don't let this season pass you by. Our biggest obstacle is not out there. Our biggest obstacle is us believing that we are the rightful heirs and that God has given it to us. Don't let selfishness or self-righteousness or self-centeredness keep you from receiving what God has for you. Come into the presence of God. Paul said in him, I live and move and I have my being. I felt today that the Lord said very clearly to me that there's some of you that have had promises told you over the years and you've been waiting for that promise to come and I'm telling you today, it's time to take your mountain. It's time to take what God has promised to you. It's time to quit going around the mountain over and over again and it's time to go up on the mountain. It's time to see what God wants you to have and what he wants you to be. I don't know what that is. It's not the same for everybody. Everybody's different. Everybody's got different mountains, but there's a mountain with your name on it. I said it this morning in the first service and I say it in this service. I told pastor, I believe that the Lord spoke to me very clearly in the first service that there's an inheritance for Grace Temple that's coming. I believe the seed that has been sown, I believe the words that have been spoken, I believe the things that have been done have all been for such a time as this. And I believe it's a new season. I believe it's a new day. I believe that the inheritance of God is ready to become yours and become this house and that you'll be able to do all that God has called you to do. And I'm telling you all in this place that in the name of the Lord God Almighty, it's time to take your mountain and receive the inheritance that God has promised to you. Would you stand? Hallelujah. I believe this is a prophetic word. It may not be for everybody. I believe it's for a lot of you. But I believe the Lord wants you to receive what he has for you. I believe that God has called us to this place and said, I want to give you what's yours. I want to give you your inheritance. I didn't say this in the first service, but God just put it in my heart. I want to just... Say it real quick and then I'm going to pray for you. Two years ago, my precious mama passed away. She was 92. My dad had passed away four or five years before that. He was 96. 
My dad had a third grade education, drove a sawmill truck when he was 11 years old, lost his finger, one of his fingers to a chain being pulled by a mule, dragging logs out of the woods. They never lived extravagantly, but they left an inheritance to me and my three brothers. It wasn't just the inheritance, it was the fact that I knew what they had paid for it. I knew my dad was a contractor as he, after he got out of the sawmill business, he was a builder. He built houses for a living, third grade education. Became a premier builder in Tallahassee, Florida. Built houses for senators and bank presidents. When I got the inheritance, it wasn't the inheritance, it was the fact of the price that was paid for. And I said, I looked at my wife and I said, I'm so thankful for parents that left me inheritance. But I want to tell you, if that's precious, how much more precious is the inheritance that's been given to us by the precious blood of Jesus Christ? He gave you something that the world can't give and he's given you something that belongs to you. And you can wait all your life and say, well, when I'm good enough or when I... Do, listen, you're never good enough. You're never worthy. Except that he makes you worthy. He brings you into the family and he says you're his child. I was the baby. I am, still am, by the way. The four boys. My oldest brother passed away at Christmas time. I'm so glad that it didn't depend on the fact that the oldest got the most. We all got an equal share. There's an equal share for you and here. It may be different, but it's still an equal share. It's your mountain. It's what God has for you. So, I'm not going to take a long time, but I'm just, if God's spoken to you today, and if you feel like there's a mountain in your life that your name is on it, and that God has given you the mountain, but you haven't possessed it yet. I want to pray for you, for God to help you to take your mountain. And I want you to come and stand right here, right now. Just come right now in the name of the Lord. If you have a mountain you need to take in your life, maybe it's a mountain of your family, of your children, of your job, of your finances. Maybe it's a mountain of some bad relationships. I don't know. There's all kind of mountains that get in the way of us and that God says, if you'll take your mountain, you'll receive your inheritance and you'll get everything that I promised for you. Today's your day to take your mountain. It's your mountain. It belongs to you. It's not my mountain. It's your mountain. God wants you to have that mountain. I know Dwayne understands this, preaching. Sometimes you preach beyond what you comprehend. I asked God all week, I said, God, I'd really like to define the mountain. He said, you can't define the mountain for everybody. The mountains are different. It's kind of by nature. God, I want to, I want to name, I want to, I want to talk about the mountain. But my mountain is not your mountain. He just said, it's time for you to take your mountain. So I want you to raise your hands all here at the front. Just raise your hands. And I'm just going to pray over you collectively, Father, in the name of the Lord God Almighty. I pray that every person here will be like Caleb, wholehearted, and say, God, whether it be a 50 years, 40 years, last month, whatever it is, God, you promised me. And in the name of the Lord God Almighty, I received the promise. I take my mountain in the name of Jesus. I receive my mountain. And Father, this day, I fight every giant. And I say, if God be for me, who can be against me? And I proclaim that in the name that's above every other name, that every giant of self will fall. And no longer will I beat myself up. But Father, in the name of Jesus, I receive what you've given to me. And this day I take my mountain and I honor it, God. 
and I'll use it for your purpose and I'll use it for your glory. And I'll be what you want me to be and I'll do what you want me to do. And God, I'll seek you first in your kingdom and let everything else be added unto me. And Lord, in you I will live and move and I will have my being as I inherit the mountain that you promised to me. I thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name. Would everybody here at the front and you want to say it at the back, say, I'm going to take my mountain in the name of Jesus. It's mine. Hallelujah. Now let's give the Lord praise. Hallelujah. 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 As you guys are returning to your place, I want to give us one more chance to say thank you to Pastor Ron for being obedient today. Would you let him know we appreciate him being here today and what he had to say? So tonight at 6.30, we're going to gather here, and I'm going to ask for your help, if you can, when I dismiss the service in just a second. Uh, if you need to run, you can feel free to head out, do take care of whatever business you need to take care of. If you've got a few minutes and you can help us turn this sanctuary over and get ready for tonight, it would be great. General Van Jones is right back here, and uh, he's going to help make this happen. So what we're going to do is we're going to stack these chairs, and we're going to leave about 40 in each section, and we're going to bring out the round tables from in there, and Van will help uh, direct uh, traffic and help make this happen. So thank you for your attention today. Thank you for uh, your faithfulness to the Lord. Go in the peace of God today. You're dismissed.